Uh, hi, Sean. How are you? What's going on? Yeah, doing good. It's good to be here. I had yeah. uh, I had COVID a week and a half or so ago, so I was worried that I was going to have a cough or something, but I'm feeling better. Oh, oh, good. I know. I know. I had the flu and it's, you know, it's like one of those things, man. It's just, you never know what's going to hit you. <laughs> Oh man, no kidding. Yeah, a little one-year-old girl had it and she was she was pretty good. My wife had it, she was way better. I was like out for a few days with the fever and the chills and everything. So it's good to be Terrible. feeling back feeling to some better. Normal. You're feeling better. Yeah. Good, good. I'm glad. I know. It takes you out, right? It does. Uh, yeah, I've been trying to serve on clients. You feel like you're half out of it, like a zombie. Am I helping these people? <laughs> it's crazy. Definitely. I know. Well, I Generally, I rest assured that, you know, even at half mass, or, you know, if you're skilled at helping people, you're still helping people. Yeah, you know? no doubt, so. for sure. Yeah, cool. Well, I'm glad. Doing? I'm good. I'm great. Just uh, yeah. busy. I've got a lot of really cool things going on. And, yeah. you know, I have a lot of children myself. So, uh, yeah. So it's just busy times, but it's all good stuff, you know. So you try yeah. to stay present in it and enjoy it instead of, you know, having it tip you into yeah. overwhelm, you know, of course. <laughs> it's yeah. good. It's all great. Yeah. So it's good. Uh, Hang I've on. been working on putting my program and the stuff I always talk about into a book. So that's, oh, my, cool. that's my cool new project, which of course is time consuming, but my hope is that it's done. Um, I actually reached out to an agent a little while ago and I had an agent who was interested, but I don't know if they'll still be interested by the time I get it done, but this way I hope to get it like on oh. its way towards moving out by the summer. That's, having it written. that's so, exciting. Yeah. yeah so it's really cool stuff. So, so it's all right good. On. Yeah, yeah. So my... I'm excited to have a conversation with you. I wrote down some notes, but um, just to kind of maybe structure the conversation, yeah. but then, um, you know, if you have anything that you want to share with people as we get going, I would love for you just to, you know, grab the yeah. reins. But I came up with a couple concepts that have been on my mind and my heart lately. And then especially just kind of um, knowing uh, a little bit about what I know about how you approach helping people. So yeah, um, if that sounds okay. That sounds great. Yeah, for okay. sure. I, I didn't know when we were talking the first time or we connecting on the idea of like the sexual template that my wife and I went through. That's kind of been what we talk about the most and in the mini course that I offer. So I thought that could be a cool promotion just as something people can grab as, at a low cost and go through themselves. Absolutely. Definitely. And so, um, you know, we can, we'll definitely like talk about it when, as we kind of wrap up, but if you, maybe we can just introduce you and what, you know, how you would introduce yourself I was trying yeah. to come up with that, but um, if you could introduce yourself and then, um, you know, I thought we would start by talking about the secret habit because I thought that's sure. an interesting uh, way. Yeah. I made a video lately that recently talking about pornography, a pornography habit as a secret sex life. Okay. Because yeah. so I thought maybe we could start there. So that sounds uh, great. if you would like to introduce yourself and kind of let me let everybody know, you know, who you are and what you are and what you do, that'd be great. Yeah, that's Just jump that's, in. <laughs> sounds great. No, let's do that. Yeah, secret habit ties sounds like that ties in well as well. So that's exciting. Yeah, yeah let's yeah. let's do it. Yeah, sounds great. So uh and how do you say your last name, Sean? Bonito. Bonito, that's what I thought it was. Okay, so welcome, Sean Bonito, to uh, our my podcast, Porn Brain Rewire. And the video can also be found on YouTube, uh, on my YouTube channel, Dr. Trish Lee, Porn Brain Rewire. So Sean is with us today, and we're going to be talking about pornography habit um, and sexual acting out behaviors as a secret habit or a secret sex life, as I sometimes talk about it. And I thought we'd also springboard into talking about um, your porn habit, not harming anyone, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. And we will dig in there because that's not what I think at all. But I know that that is popularized in especially videos on YouTube or people who are telling people what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear then I know something and, and hopefully you'll round it out for us as we discuss, but I know you focus on at least one piece of it is focusing on fantasy and the role that fantasy plays and 
being able to get fantasy under control. And I talk to people about that all day, every day, basically. So I thought that'd be another good place for us to anchor in a little bit. And then I always try to share with people that there's a ripple effect of change mm -hmm. when you change this habit for yourself. And I thought we could kind of go there too. So maybe you could just share with people what, um, you know, what your background is and what led yeah. you here and kind of what you have to offer. Of course, Trish. Great to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's great to sew into your audience. Uh, it's always a privilege of mine because my story is of pornography addiction, masturbation addiction, erectile dysfunction, you know, lying to my wife and so on and so forth. So I always tell people that my helping of other people in my coaching practice is kind of me going through the school of hard knocks, learning what it's like to not only recover, but actually experience freedom. And I think so many people are longing for that who are stuck in this, you know, call it secret habit, which is our organization's name. So yeah, we're, we're a big advocate of sexual integrity and freedom because that's what we found. Like so many of the resources out there are about don't do this and don't do that and avoid this instead of pursue this, let's get healthy, let's get free, let's take ownership of our mind and make good choices. So that's really like the heart behind who I am and what I do. Uh, Secret Habit in of itself, uh, as, as our organization, it was birthed out of this time where I was feeling this calling. I always wanted to help people, got into the business world, did some different things and realized like, I'm not really helping people the way I want to. And when I got sober, not quite had this huge level of freedom yet, but when I got sober, my story is I really felt God put it on my heart that this is how I'm going to help people, which was the last thing I thought I would ever be doing. So that is typically well, how it goes. I mean, that's my story too, where yes. I say, porn fell in my lap and I'm like, porn, you've got to be kidding me right now. This is where, this is how I have to help people. Porn. Yeah. And then there it sat in my lap and I couldn't get rid of it. So I'm like, all right, here's the mission. Let's, yes. you know, that's exactly it. Cause I had been helping people, you know, through brain performance. And I'm like, this yeah. is the worst brain thing that is, I seriously think it's the worst brain thing that is out there. And I'm like, all yeah. right, I'm perfectly positioned to help people. So I hear you on that. Yes. Word. You know, I had to sit, I have two blue chairs over there and kind of this loungy area in my office. And I literally sat there one day, like, am I, am I going for this? And I didn't even <laughs> tell anybody. I didn't tell my husband for almost nine months Wow. That after I put videos on YouTube, I told him, I said, babe, I have something going on. <laughs> would you like I I said I, you might shut me down you might have the the propensity to shut me down would you like I said I feel like I want to share it with you he's like don't share it with me just keep going <laughs> and then on New Year's <sighs> Eve last year it was last year two years ago New Year's Eve I'm like I have to tell you I cannot go into another year without you knowing this is that wild <laughs> wow so so there you go like it's usually not something we choose it's something that's often given to us because like I don't know if people know like statistics, like at least in the church, like 7% of churches offer any program for this issue. And like, I would be scared to guess what percentage of that is even helpful. So yeah. when, you know, whatever, if it, for me, it's God, I felt called by God, but whatever people want to say that is, it's like when that gets thrown onto our lap, it's for usually a good reason, because there is such a lack of good quality help. And that's what's causing more harm is this system that's been built around recovery has really just been behavior management. It hasn't been helpful. It's been actually often very harmful to a wife or a spouse. And it's it so really bad. does. I mean, yeah, not, not it doesn't. Not to stop you, but just to interject, I was just sharing with someone, literally every day I talk to someone who tells me a horror story of how they were sent in the wrong direction, uh, spending thousands of dollars being told the wrong stuff. And then even the men that I work with, they'll, they'll say to me, like, you know, when we get into conversation, that just didn't seem right to me. You know, just some mm. of the awful advice. So I'm totally yeah. with you on that. Yeah. So, so that's a big piece of why we do what we do. So, you know, my stories, I saw porn at 10, uh, back in the day, that was really when the internet was kind of taking off. And like, that's when most kids were started really being on it a lot. Uh, it was my neighbor who found his dad's magazines. And then within that year or so, I ended up seeing my dad watching pornography. A, f a friend of mine's dad came in while we were watching it and he affirmed it. So it really got ingrained as a young boy that this is what men do. And it's, you know, they don't seem to think it's a problem. They're, they 
they like I saw my dad doing it alone at night in the dark. Like it must be this thing that is good, but you have to keep it a secret. <laughs> so like as a young boy, you don't you don't know any better. You're just taking in information and making up your own story, and it felt yeah, good. Programming, programming. Exactly. You know, that's what, you know we're programmed, and some. Yep, I know. I hear you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it filled that void that I that I was seeking for of being seen and being delighted in and being accepted and validated. And, and that's really like young Sean and then growing up, you know, got into toxic relationships. It's amazing how like pornography becomes like a best friend. So I would say no to even hanging out with friends. I would, you know, stop being as um, active in sports and like my homework went down the drain. So you just realize like you're a teenager and you're, this vice is so strong. The grip is immense. So, you know, that led me into you know, struggling with erectile dysfunction. It started as porn induced because of the chemical makeup of my brain was absolutely wonky. (laughs) And that led to me feeling like a total failure and a flawed man. Like I'm a 19 year old man who's supposed to be healthy with all this adrenaline and, and and I can't get an erection. So just my identity became a huge struggle in those times. It basically, I would based my whole world around how I performed. So that's kind of when I got into the business world, I figured, hey, am I, if I'm going to focus on performance, I might as well do it in an area that I can get rich and cover up my secret <laughs> habit. That was literally my mentality. Like, let's get rich, cover up my secret habit. And it's so scary because when you get into those places with the wrong foundation and programming and mentality, it actually makes the problem worse. So I got into worse relationships. My porn addiction got worse. My shame intensified. I isolated more. And that's just that you know, that really ugly cycle that we get into without even knowing we're on that rabbit wheel. So that's why I love sharing my story, helping people see that this, this is not a a abnormal story. This is most people, not just men, either women's story as well. So that's, that's my story with pornography. It led to erectile dysfunction. It led to me lying to my wife, bringing porn into my marriage. Um, I did finally quit pornography, which was fantastic, but I still struggled with immense anxiety and performance and, 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 and all these other things that led to me having then psychological erectile dysfunction. So I just have so many layers to my story. (laughs) And what I normally tell people is like, I don't have time to get into all that today. I never, ever do on a podcast. It's like, there's so many layers. So my wife and I actually just released our own podcast in February, which we're really excited about. So people want to get, thank you. It is a big win, especially as we do it when our baby's sleeping. Oh my gosh, it's crazy life, right? I know. (laughs) It is. So like, if people want to get to know the deeper Sean and my wife, Helena, they can tune into the secret habit podcast. Awesome. You know, I'm going to get into a couple of things today that I just won't be able to cover in, in depth. So like they can go to secrethabit.ca slash courses and see some of the things that we're doing, but that's a bit of like who I am. I have an awesome wife, a one-year-old daughter. I live in Canada, which sometimes you don't hear too many Canadians. <laughs> So that's just kind of the passion as to why I do what I do, because my story is all those layers and I love helping men with those. Yeah, And you know what I think is really cool that, well, first of all, you articulated that. So, you know, it's so complex, but you articulated it simplistically, but also, you know, highlighting all the layers to it. And people don't understand men who struggle with this don't understand the amount and the the depth of the layers that yes. are involved. Yeah. And like there was a gentleman in, I run a group. So in my program, it's a 90 day program and you can add a group coaching and we yeah. do weekly calls. And there was a guy who was new on the call and he was saying, he asked me like a question about being able to overcome initial urges and cravings. And, you know, and I'm like, basically, you know, you've got to get your, your offensive plan set up, which is going to take you time, but this is your defensive Mm -hmm. plan in the short run. And he hadn't really dug into the content of the program yet. So he's like, when I got done talking, it wasn't very long, but he's like, this is what I'm hearing. This isn't about porn at all. (laughs) Like, exactly. I'm like, porn is a symptom. It's literally just the symptom. And there's all these layers and levels and some are going to be real deep for you and building self-awareness across that journey and figuring out which ones are the deep layers that need more time and energy to address them and which ones are, are a little bit more surface level. But, you know, I really like the way that your story is just about every man's story that is involved and more women. It is still very heavy on men that are involved in porn, porn addiction, but more women every day, unfortunately, just because of the super normal stimulus. 
and the yeah. availability porn in your pocket, you know, I'm sure, you know, the triple A's it's affordable because it's yes. free for most people accessible and people can access it anonymously. And it's giving their brain exactly what it's looking for to offset the chaos or the pain or the dysfunction of your life. So, um, so thank you. Cause that was a really cool um, synopsis of what has gone on for you. And I think just about everybody can relate who cares to listen to this content and I'm yeah, so glad to hear. So let me ask you one more question. Then we'll dig into a couple of the concepts is that, you know, how you talked about where you were in recovery and you gained sobriety, but you hadn't gained freedom. Can you kind of like just characterize or give color to the journey from sobriety to freedom? If you're able to do yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I kind of always say it as like when you, the initial stages is sobriety, it's you stopping a behavior but like to renew the mind and to grow in integrity to be a vulnerable honest person is going to take time to build that character to build that maturity so i usually say like sobriety for a lot of guys is like a year and if they are pursuing and progressing towards bigger purpose and integrity after about a year i think they start having this amazing opportunity for self-awareness so like growing yeah, in sexual see, integrity yeah. Yeah. So yeah, sobriety for me is stopping something, mm -hmm. you know, we have to recalibrate the brain in the beginning, like 90 days. So you do some behavioral things, but if you don't back that up with the foundational mindset changes and identity changes and heart changes, you're just gonna, you know, that if you do ha happen to be on Instagram and a picture pops up, if you're just dealing with sobriety, you're going to fall back into addiction pretty quickly. Yeah. I love that. And, and people always, you know, the number one question is how long is this going to take me? And yeah. it's like, really, it's kind of talking about uh, the way I talk about it is if you in 90 days, if you can gain traction, you can set and you're, you're working the aspects that you actually need to address. You're able to look at them, think about them, not just learn them, implement them in your life. Yes. If you're implementing those things across the 90 days, what happens is you can begin to feel that transformation and you know, you're on your way. You're not there yet, but you know, you're on your yeah. way and you have a level of sobriety and you can feel these pieces kind of clicking into place in terms of the puzzle, which is leading you towards freedom. But in the end, and I love the way you kind of, you know, it's sobriety to freedom because the way I talk about it is rewiring to hardwiring yes. your brain. Yeah. And when you hardwire your brain, you've put this foundation and you've just nailed all the things I talk about, you know, personality, attitudes, thought processes, habits, routines, feelings, emotional intelligence, and emotional yeah. maturity. And when, as all those things click into place, then what happens is you've built this foundation and you have to be very careful about keeping your foundation, but we all do to not fall That's into right. anxiety or yes. distraction. So you build this amazing life on purpose through inspiration and that is what you protect. You're no longer trying to stay out of the screen. You're just yes. trying to stay on purpose and move forward. So, it, you know, we're, we're completely on the same page in the way that we talk and think about it, which is yeah. the way to be successful. People don't understand. You have to dig into those things. And <laughs> yeah. that is how you can gain. Um, so in terms of if you're willing to segue, um, you know, I've seen videos lately where people say, you know, your porn habit isn't hurting anyone. And, and I use this scale also, but I qualify it for people because there is a problematic porn use scale out there and it has, hmm. I think it's eight items on it. And basically the gist of it is, you know, if you're spending your time, money and energy on porn, if you're hiding it, if you've tried to stop and you're not yeah. able to, if you try to stop and you have withdrawal symptoms, um, if, you know, if it's something that has importance and, uh, if it's distracting you from your work, school, mm -hmm. or your relationships, those types of things. But then other people will say, you know, if it's not impacting you in that way, then your porn habit isn't a problem. And so like, you know, thinking about your and your wife's journey, how did you know it became, it was an actual problem for you beyond erectile dysfunction? I always joke, half joke with people that yeah. That's when people call because, you know, they're like, so true. Dysfunction. this is actually <laughs> showing up in my life. But beyond that, like, you know, yeah. what, you know, what would you say to someone that says a porn habit isn't a problem? Yeah, well, the bigger picture that a lot of people don't want to talk about is that the porn industry promote sex trafficking so like that is like a way bigger picture and scope than most people want to go but if we actually like 
read about or, or listened to or learned from past porn stars and people that have been in the industry, like they're very rarely on set without drugs and alcohol. A lot of the times they are threatened with their life or something along those lines that if they don't do a certain act, they're, yeah, they're, they're in coercion. jeopardy. I mean, yeah. but even, even if you scale it back one step, none of it's actually real. <laughs> like that's what I, yes. you know, when people, when people will say things like that to me, or, you know, mainly it's haters or people who don't want to buy into this concept is that, you know, that's not real. It's the industry, de industry designs it to yeah. hijack your brain. Like, you know, being able to increase intensity and in a click because yeah. your brain has built tolerance and it needs a higher level stimulus to keep going and having that stimulus available to you immediately in, in multiple forms. And the fact that none of it is actually real, it distorts a person's complete reality yeah. and thinking. And, and yeah. you know, in that distortion is, you know, and I, and I talk to people about this a lot, obviously, you know, in that distortion, it colors and it makes them mm -hmm. see the entire people, you know, there's objectification fantasy, yes. and this might be a good time for us to yeah. talk about, you know, I know that you talk about facing and tracing and then replacing fantasy. Yeah. Um, that becomes a major thing for people that they're no longer in a reality, their lives and especially their sex lives yeah. are are informed by this distorted unreality that is not good for humankind, but yes. it's also not good for their brain. And then now they seek out that fantasy world because it is this arousal template. Um, mm -hmm. So what do you think about fantasy? What do you teach people yeah. about fantasy? Yeah, I've learned so much about fantasy from my good friend, uh, Drew Boa, who runs Husband Material, and he's just an amazing asset in that area. Um, but really with fantasy, like, we we so some people have this like reaction to the word fantasy that it's like only sexual but like fantasy in of itself is a longing for something and the problem is is most people especially younger people that have grown up in this pornified culture this sexual culture like they don't understand like a, that a longing for intimacy isn't sex like they think intimacy is sex they think connection is sex they think everything leads to sex and like that's really where people's fantasies go because our primitive mind or our primitive brain like we're just programmed to be so primitive nowadays like we're basically just li little kid brains and adult lizard bodies because <laughs> lizard brain that's exactly it so in terms of what people are fantasizing it's, it's usually like a longing for intimacy or a longing for connection that then gets hijacked by eroticized rage is a term we hear or just just a sex sexualization in general and then a longing for connection actually is like one of the biggest reasons a lot of guys struggle with same-sex attraction nowadays they long for male intimacy which is beautiful to be able to be intimate with a male but when it becomes sexualized that turns into same-sex attraction homosexuality or like you know even for me like one of my fantasies was that i would be running down the road and this attractive woman walking her dog would stop me and start talking to me and that would lead to us having sex and like that was just for that was me actually longing to connect with women in a way that is normal healthy and beautiful but because of my upbringing and the pornified brain something that should be normal is having a conversation with an attractive or any person become sexualized because there's a element of wanting power wanting to be pursued wanting to be validated and when those things get hijacked by sexualization or anger or pride that's it leads to shame and guilt like well, what's wrong with me why would i go to that place and that's usually that lizard brain taking over also term like inner child sometimes it's like that inner child comes out and you know children don't make good decisions you know you get you give a child a well, gun they're going to do something wounded, bad with it especially wounded children yes, when i exactly. talk about inner child work i and that is part of something that's in my program where i teach people yeah that that you have an inner child and that inner child is wounded. And I really like the way that you just talked about that because it's so true that a lot of times whatever you're seeking for in the screen is something that was either dysfunctional for you in your childhood yeah. or was missing. And especially when it comes to same sex attraction, there's many men who didn't have a strong relationship with their father or didn't have a father figure who was nurturing. And then you're absolutely right through the conditioning and the 
constant traversing of the neural pathways that sexualize that, yeah. then it becomes distorted by that need for connection, intimacy in a healthy way it becomes completely distorted by, you know, use it or lose it. You keep using those neural pathways into the screen. Yeah. It, you know, frames it in that, but underneath it is, and when I work with people, when I discern that is, and I'm sure you do the same thing is that, you know, if you realize that building healthy intimacy with a male role model, if you can't get that from your actual father, because emotional yeah. maturity isn't there from him, you can create that from other people in your world yes. and find yourself a male mentor who can play that healthy, intimate role for you. And that I like to give people takeaways on the podcast too. So yeah. if any of this is resonating with you, that could be something that you need. Another um, person I'm working with, he's undergoing a, an approach and engage, uh, actually a few different people that I work with, I have them doing approach and an engage exercise with people in the world because they are interested yeah. in finding a partner. But because it's so sexualized, the minute they approach because mm. of this fantasy, it's like I'm approaching for sex. So I encourage people and another takeaway if you're listening, to approach all different people and authentically mm -hmm. find something that you want to compliment them or share or connect Good. with them. Not just young women that you might perceive as like hookup culture or something like that. And it's an interesting exercise when, you know, young men do this because at first it's terrifying, yeah. but then once they compliment older women or yes. then they'll compliment men and totally works my my husband likes shoes he'd kill me if he ever listened to any of my stuff which he doesn't which is why i'm going to talk about him <laughs> yet again is that he's a shoe kind of guy he likes shoes so i bought him these really cool ombre wolf and shepherd shoes but anyways he was at the mall and another dude came up to him and complimented his shoes and so then of course he comes home and he's like you know some dude just complimented my shoes at the mall he loved that and you know that yeah. is a way that you know so I thought it was really cool that that guy went out of his way because that does take courage to tell yes. another man that you like the way that they're dressed and it's a bro moment, but it's serving everybody. And that's what, you know, the young yeah. men that I work with, they'll go, I can't believe how good it feels to compliment yes. people because they respond to it. And then it makes me feel good. I'm like, that's what vulnerability and intimacy is. And you're building that muscle and taking the sexualization out of it because their brains just want to learn how to talk to young women who they, yes. they just are sexualizing. So when you color it differently with humanity, it takes that sexualization out. So I love that example that That's you're talking so about in terms of like, you know, the fantasy that you've had, it takes this experience of connecting with your neighbors and, you know, yeah. makes it so that it's sexualized and you can take that out, but you have to use new neural pathways. Mm -hmm. You can't keep, can't keep going back into the screen because you're just building those neural pathways. So when you stop doing that and then you practice these other skills, yeah. you know, it really can help you to rewire your brain in that direction. Yeah. But so good, that. Trish. So I good. And you were, you were asking before, like, um, like, what are some of like the signs or like, you know, if someone only watches porn and like doesn't fit into some of those categories, like, like this ties in perfectly. Like I remember I would be so stressed to go to even the grocery store. Cause if there was a girl behind the till, how would I look at her? What would I say? And you get so caught up because in porn, like the pizza delivery guy comes by and ends up having sex five minutes later, like these normal day-to-day -day life things that should be just part of our normal life. Hey, how are you? How's your day become so uh, such a scary moment because it's like, well, on that video, it led to sex. So maybe this, and then we've get this anxiety and this pressure. We feel like we have to perform a certain way. So like that is like, that was totally my story. And I remember when I got uh, sober and then free, it was like, I went to the grocery store and I could look at people in the eye and smile. That was a breakthrough for me. It was a monumental breakthrough. It's amazing. And people don't understand. People ask me all the time, is my social anxiety affected by porn? And it's a yes. capital Y-E-S exclamation point because of exactly what you're talking about is that, you know, it really impacts. And another thing that you said that I think is going to hit home with people, I just want to kind of talk about it for a second, is that it's life is an experience, not a performance, but when mm. you watch performances, and that's why I go back to, those are performances that you're watching. They are not real. And that's I know right. after watching it for so long, you forget that, but 
it makes it so that now your life becomes this series of how do I perform in these different situations? And yeah. the framework shift is coming back to, I'm supposed to be experiencing my life, not worrying about how I'm performing in them. And, and going back to erectile dysfunction, that's why that psychological erectile dysfunction lingers around because yeah. there's actual erectile dysfunction there in the first place. If you're using your brain wrong, we know, and yeah. just to remind people that erectile dysfunction comes from desensitization of the reward centers in your brain. Yeah. It's an actual neurophysiological problem, physical problem. But when you can heal your brain from that, and when you undergo a solid program, your brain rewires itself and your, your reward centers will come back online. But then this psychological aspect of performance anxiety may linger around until you shift your framework to, this is an experience I'm having with my partner. And yes. healthy women don't want a performance. This is another thing men don't understand too. Healthy women want to be with their partner. They don't want yeah. something that looks like porn. They want to have a fun experience That's in right. an engaging way. They are not even looking for a performance. So you don't even need to have any anxiety about a performance. If you can have a shared experience it, and like you said, you sought out toxic relationships when you were in the screen a lot, there does need to be an evaluation of your partner as you become healthier, when you come out of the screen and go, okay, like, is my partner healthy? And it doesn't mean you ditch your partner if they're, <laughs> if they're not the healthiest version of themselves, but it means you could both go on a transformational yeah. growth journey. But you yes. know, it, this life's an experience, not a performance. So when you go to the grocery store, you can make eye contact and connect with that person in an intimate, cool way not a performance. So I, yeah. I think that resonates home, hits home for a lot of people. I know people struggle with that. Yeah. I think when our mind gets so focused on like, of like, I can't do that. I can't do this. I can't do that. Like I, I'm reading a book right now called the great sex rescue. And she talks about how so many women as they grow up are, are taught to be gatekeepers for men's sexual arousal. Like so many Christian books, especially it's like men just have this need and women have to, you know, make sure they're like almost like a brake pedal. And as a woman grows up with that mentality, because the message in, at least in the church is so much like wait till marriage to have sex. They basically just play brake pedal, the whole dating relationship, engage relationship. And they never slow down to experience the relationship because they're always on guard of this is too much. What is he doing? He's breathing too hard. And it's like, wow, that's so eye opening. Like, and then they get married and that's supposed to quote unquote, solve the problem. But it's like, that's why we have sexless marriages, frustrated marriages, is because they never actually communicated and experienced things together. It was like, yeah, just these crazy narratives were given that don't help anybody and then wait yeah, till and marriage. It goes, and, and it goes back to shame for everybody because, you know, if women are, which I think there is a shift now, unfortunately, in the opposite direction because so mm, many young women yeah. learn to be hypersexual or learn to be the, yeah. the, you know, on the opposite side of giving into that hypersexuality because it's running rampant and maybe yeah. the gatekeeping is breaking down, which is not good for anybody. Not that I want women to be gatekeepers. Clearly, you know, I think more old school or older in quotes people, um, women have to increase hyposexuality because they are pumping the brakes the whole time. So they learn to be the hypo too low, not yeah. to talk about it, not to want it, not to think about it. And then, you know, on the other end, when you have secret habits, of hypersexuality. So then yeah. the disconnect is so far for partners. Wow. And so then what I tell women who don't usually like to hear it is to be able to evaluate that. And you might have to take your hyposexuality and bring it back up to perfect mm -hmm. levels of sexuality. Mm -hmm. When men are bringing that hyper down and especially yes. if you're sucked into a porn habit, it is hypersexuality and it yeah. needs to be brought down. But then now you're on even playing fields and you can communicate and there, and it should be mutual not gatekeeping or yeah and not exactly. hyperdrive and i'm i i like that i'll have to read that book what's that book called yeah the great sex listening? rescue yeah, yeah by cool. sheila gregoire she's really on fire right now writing some great material and kind of picking apart these narratives we've been given in the church about sex and porn yeah, addiction cool. and the, some of these books that have been cornerstone books for so long that are actually really harmful she's really 
picking out what's harmful and educating people. And it's just really refreshing. Yeah, cool. Well, I'm reading like nine books right now. You know how that goes. (laughs) (laughs) So I have to, which is a good, it's a blessing and a curse, but I'm reading Will Smith's new book. It is so good. And he talks about all of the pieces of, uh, you know, what people need to address to get on purpose and to balance their lives. But it's a 16 hour book and I'm at the tail end. I'm on like hour 15. It's almost wrapping up, but it's been really, um, that's cool. It's really been a great book, but um, I'll have to check that out. Um, Okay, so I thought we would kind of wrap up with the idea of this ripple effect of change, unless you have something else that you wanted to share and or any other thoughts on any other concepts before we kind of dive into the last one that I think will put a bow on what we've been talking about. Yeah, I I think we're covering some great stuff. I know you were asking about fantasy and you mentioned like the three themes. Um, Mm -hmm. Just to give like a simple bite-sized theme that I like to help people go through with healing from pornography, kind of this idea of what it looks like is like step one is becoming curious, which means that we look at our story, we look at our day-to-day habits, we look at why we do what we do and start to learn from it. And what does that do that leads us into our story? Like, wow, did I learn that from my mom or my dad or a coach or a bully? And just being curious, which has to happen with compassion, which a lot of addicts don't do well because they're hard on themselves, defeatism, shame. So that's first step, becoming curious. Second step is becoming consistent, which is self-awareness, which is emotional fitness, which is becoming um, consistent with the vulnerability, having a faithful friend that you're pursuing purpose with together. And then the third one is becoming confident, which is stepping into more of that freedom mind, taking ownership of your thought life, your perceptions, your decisions. Um, Doing these things is so key. So becoming curious, consistent, confident is kind of just like a cool one, two, three I like to talk about. (laughs) Obviously, it's bigger and more than that, but I love what you have the unwire, rewire, hardwire. So it's always helpful to have these three little things to walk by, right? Yeah, they have schemas, you know, to kind of be able to you know, have people anchor into different ideas. I love that too. And it's exactly, I mean, it's just absolutely in line. And the only reason I care if people have things that are in line with me is not because I'm right, is because I know a lot of the science behind it. And I know what needs to be in place for people to be successful. So, and everything you're talking about is exactly what people need to be successful. So when I have people on the podcast, I'll really only have people that I feel like, or at least Mm. that I like, I want people you know, just for the listener too, but, and for your sake is that, you know, it has to be a good fit who you feel like you want to work with. And I don't necessarily want everybody to work with me. If that's not a good fit, I want them to work with anybody who's going to help them out of this situation. And that is the ripple effect. And what people don't understand is because people write in comments on YouTube or when they talk to me, they're like, let's go after the porn industry. I'm like, nah, that is not my mission. That's not what fell into my lap that day. What did was if each person who has a porn habit decides to leave it behind, the ripple effect is so huge. Just each person shifting that in themselves, because when they get in purpose, get on purpose, and they're able to do that, you know, curious investigation of what's going on, it's massive for them. People can unprogram themselves from not just their programming, their inner child, from generations of programming before them. This is multi-generational. It doesn't always have to play out as a porn habit, but the underlying issues are multi-generational. We got them from our parents who got them from their parents who got them from their parents. And I know I'm working my booty off to try to shift those things for my children so yeah. that, you know, and, or, and I'm always curious. So I love that because when I go to do something or if I've done something and feels off to me, or even like a, a first line of defense is if something happens with my kids, cause I'm parenting a lot of teenagers right now. So it's like something uncomfortable that I have to engage with them, which would have been ignored by my parents because yeah. they didn't have the wow. maturity to be able to approach. I will sit with that and I'll go, okay, what would my parents do? Hmm. What's the polar opposite of that? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. like, honestly, that'll be my starting point if I don't know what to do in the moments, but I will really, really intentionally think like, okay. And so I've made some really wild choices as a parent to parent my kids that are the opposite of my programming so yeah. that I can shift some of those, you know, and, and so we all can do this in our life, get curious about the things that we react 
and the things that we just do in a conditioned manner. And then, you know, especially if you are going back into porn and sexualization, objectification, those neural pathways are deep if you've been using yeah. it for a long time. So, so, you know, in that case, you're going to just move towards it very quickly. And then being able to get curious about it to be able to take the, the next, you know, the other pathway that you do yeah. in fact have to take thousands of times before <laughs> it bores yeah. itself in there, you know, and that's the conditioning piece where, you know, consistently condition yourself and move into confidently into the future. So I think that's great. Um, so then how did the ripple effect, you know, so let me just characterize a ripple effect real yeah. quick. And then the question is how did that show up in your life? So, you know, you went from sobriety to freedom and clearly that's a journey, the transformational journey or the opportunity. I, I, I know when I work with people, I use the, the words framework shift because they'll be like, what's the, what's the answer to this problem? A framework shift. Yeah. <laughs> like, I know you hate hearing this. And then, you know, when tough things land in people's laps or come towards people, I'll be like, you have the opportunity. So, you know, kind of overusing those terms, but, you know, the ripple effect is if, if one person like you, you, you change your behavior and you change what the generations before you were doing, then that impacted you and you moved into your life in a different way. And it changed your thoughts. It changed your behaviors, the action steps that you took that clearly impacted your wife. So that's one way. And even yeah. though you're, you're, it's a daughter, right? You have a daughter who's one. Yeah. A daughter, your daughter's one, like, you know, that's impacted her massively, whether you even know it or not yet, maybe, oh, you yes. do, but you know, when she's 15, it's a different life for her now than it was when you were still watching porn for real. Yeah. And so, and your friends and your, the people you work with and the community are in like the ripple effect goes out so far and why that people don't really understand that. But how did you see that play out in your life? Yeah. Oh, it's such a great question. I love that term ripple effect. And I'm just thinking like even yesterday I had a zoom call with it lives locally, a past client of mine from about a year ago. And he was actually an NHL Stanley cup champion. So like high level guy, mm -hmm. you know, when I was with him, meeting with him, coaching him, he was frustrated like in his, like he was a really high level fundraiser for this big organization, but just frustrated wanting to be more creative, but porn didn't allow him that space was frustrated with his marriage and all these things. So we're talking on zoom yesterday and I'm just like, dude, it's been a year. He's telling me these things that are happening in his life that you, someone would write like a, a life biography about. And then he ended up wanting to drop a book off. So I got to see him in person for the first time in a while. I was just like, he's a different person. So like the ripple effect of seeing what he's doing. And he's actually volunteering at a local organization in Halifax here that I used to work at that. And, that, and now he's helping men with pornography addiction. He just did a disclosure with a couple the other day. He took it. He did a, he did a talk for a youth and for a church congregation a couple weeks ago. It's like, that's so cool. And that's happened X number of times with guys in the area, just because I've been able to coach other men. But my wife and I got invited to speak in Lebanon. We got to speak to 60 leaders and train and equip them on how to talk to youth about the harms of pornography. We got to speak to six different high schools in Lebanon and impact kids kids that were adding us on Instagram and telling us how great it was. And like, we don't expect that kind of stuff, like to go to different countries and whatnot. So like, that's some of the bigger ripple effect of how like our speaking and our coaching and our story is impacted. But yeah, like my wife and I, we have a podcast today, which is just us sharing as like, we're sitting on our couch in our living room, having a conversation and like, apparently our conversations impact people. Like that is really cool. That's really special that we can just talk as a married couple and people want to hear that because of what we've gone through. I, you know, I always kind of like say like, we love cuddling in bed and like to be able to cuddle in bed with my daughter and not care if I'm naked or not, because I, I'm free to choose health and integrity and just how I've seen it with my, even my family, like my parents know what I do and they, they support it. They, they care about it. Like they're not embarrassed about it. Like the ripple effect in my family. So it's huge. I could go on forever because I get so amazing? pumped about how it yeah, impacts. That is really cool. That's very cool. And especially like, I love how you recognize your impact on other men and then the impact that they have, and, you know, and at the end of this journey is service to others, you know, and that's a primary thing in 12 step programs. But I yeah. think anybody who actually goes through this transformation, it doesn't have to be in the area of porn addiction, but when you yeah. get on purpose, everything on purpose 
contributes to the human condition. It doesn't take from it. So mm-hmm. when you get on purpose and you really are inspired and you're, you know, in spirit and you're adding to the world, it's an amazing thing. And then that yeah. people feel it. So that's really cool. Okay. Yeah. So tell people again where they can find you um, if they're looking for help. Totally. Yeah. So in terms of the sexual template that was mentioned or the becoming curious, consistent, confident, those are both courses I offer at secrethabit.ca slash courses. So secrethabit.ca will be the hub where you can find out our resources, learn about our coaching, hear our podcast. So that would definitely be the hub. But yeah, Secret Habit Podcast, you want to learn more about my wife and I and who we are, our story, what we get into, because you might like our flavor, our vibe. You might relate to my story more. And that's what's so cool about what you're saying, Trish. So yeah, secrethabit.ca will definitely be the hub. And those two mini courses I have are actually on a really good price right now. I was going to raise the price, wanted to wanted to wait until I was on this podcast so I could leave it at $49 Canadian, which for Americans is like two dollars. So if you want to, if you want to get a really sweet deal on these mini courses, go to secrethabit.ca slash courses, and I'm gonna leave them at that price for until this episode's released and give it a couple of weeks so people can get a good price on it. Yeah, sweet, awesome, and I'm gonna get it up um soon, uh, right. very soon. So this way, we yeah, can get perfect. That so that's really cool. All right, well, thank yeah. you for joining me. I totally appreciate it, and uh, let's re let's keep reconnecting because I think, like you said. It's fun to have, you know, friends in this space because uh, unfortunately for the world, the need is always going to uh, max out the people who are here to serve mm. those who need it. So uh, we'll keep collaborating. And just before we wrap up, just a, a uh, shameless, because I don't believe in shame, plug is that just to tell you what we were talking about initially, and I don't know if I shared this with you, I think I did that on top of the programs that I have to help people, I created a nonprofit. And so I did raise some money last year, not a lot because I have not, actually, I really have not tried to raise money, but I'm grateful to everybody who contributed. So with the money that I raised, I am creating the first digital program and I've already got the videographer and the guy um, lined up to get it created. But that program is going to be a short video that is sent to as many people mm-hmm. who are leaders in organizations or, or psychotherapists, primary care physicians, pastors, and church leaders, youth organization leaders, and just a short, snappy, easy to watch video on the harms of pornography consumption and compulsive masturbation and what they can do, which is mm-hmm. send them to, you know, people who are prepared to help them. So trying to get the word out there to people who don't know what they don't know and they're not serving people. And so taking the money that was raised last year and putting it to good use as soon as possible in this year so that obviously we get that message out into the world to get that ripple effect going. So so that's in the mix. So to try to get right there to trying to go upstream with this thing, help people who are already impacted. But if we can go upstream and help people like you talking to kids at school, beautiful, you know, going upstream and trying to prevent the next generation from being roped in as much as they already are. But conversation for different (laughs) areas. Yes. So, so many layers that we can get into for hours and hours, but yes. Hours, I know. That's why I try to wrap it up before we lose people. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you for joining me. I really appreciate it. And then we'll talk next time soon, right? We'll reconnect. Yeah, it was a privilege to share. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Sean.